Welcome back. I'm Ann Jeanette Levy coming to you live from the courthouse here in Santa Fe, New Mexico, where the involuntary manslaughter trial of Alec Baldwin is well underway. We spent the morning hearing testimony, cross-examination uh, by Alec Baldwin's defense team of Marissa Popple, uh, a crime scene evidence technician with the Santa Fe County Sheriff's Office. She was grilled about how they searched uh, certain places where they searched, how thoroughly they searched, and the fact that they never figured out how that live ammo ended up on the Rust movie set. We're on a lunch break until 2 o'clock Mountain Time. That's 4 o'clock Eastern Time, and we're taking your questions with a fabulous panel that I have with me here. It includes a retired FBI agent, attorney, and firearms expert on movie sets and TV sets, Bobby Chacon. John Day is a criminal defense attorney here in Santa Fe, New Mexico. And Safa Robinson is a defense attorney and former prosecutor, also a host here at Law and Crime. Uh, let's get back to the questions, guys. Um, I'll throw this one to you, Safa. Belgian Brawler on YouTube asks, how is this not a mistrial since the investigation was mishandled? What do you say about that? Well, that's exactly why we're here. That's going to be an issue for the jury to decide. At this point in time, there's no basis for a mistrial, at least from what I've seen. The trial has to commence. The prosecution has to go forward and present their case. If there are things that happen along the line or throughout the trial that are grounds for a mistrial, then at that point, the defense can raise it, and that is a possibility. But until that happens, there's an issue and there's a question for the jury to decide, and the trial is going to continue to go forward. John, this question comes from Instagram. It's a Tomps 99 She asks, how beneficial will Hannah Gutierrez Reed be for the prosecution? Will it be an intense cross-examination of her? Well, you know, we, what we've heard is that her attorney said she is not going to testify. She's going to claim uh, her right under the Fifth Amendment not to say anything. She's got an appeal pending uh, on on her conviction. So I think while she is a player in this, we're going to hear testimony about her unless something you know highly unusual happens and there's no, a... it's it's changed. She's testifying. She um, is testifying. She's testifying okay. likely. They plan to call her tomorrow morning. Okay, I, I know the there was. Plan. Now we're moving at a snail's pace here, but uh, right. that's the plan. That was, and again, the lawyers, the local lawyers, have been saying that there's certainly uh, some potential for that to uh, to tank. But look, you know, the jury is going to see her if that does take place as the person who went to trial, got convicted. Um, are they going to are they going to say the person who's responsible has already? Uh, paid the price. The person who's responsible is paying their debt to society. So why is Alec Baldwin also responsible? I mean, the fact is, I think there's going to be a lot of, of jury concern, discussion, or wondering about, well, if she's the armor, she had the responsibility. You know, after her trial, we talked to the jurors in the case. We talked to some of them, and they said, look, all we thought was, all that, we, all that mattered to us was she had one job, and she didn't do it. Alec Baldwin did not have that job. I know Bobby was just talking about, yes, it's a real gun. You're responsible for what comes out of a real gun. But again, this was a movie set where everything else is artificial. So the fact that she has already gone through this process, the justice, the wheels of justice have turned and they sort of crushed her, but now she's doing 18 months. So are they going to hold anyone else responsible? Mm -hmm. This one's from Instagram, Bobby. Eric Holland 85 says uh, or asks, why I just can't stop for why I just can't stop breaking my brains over is how did this happen in the first place? It is beyond strange. I mean, it is beyond strange, Bobby. You've got some live ammo floating around on this set. It's in the holster. It's on the prop cart. That prop cart was a disaster. It was not organized. So how does something like this happen? Because I looked at that box of dummy rounds this morning when they showed it. I immediately saw the live round. I fired guns before. I'm no Annie Oakley, but I knew what I was looking at. Yeah, it, it was hard for me to believe when I first heard this story because the sets that I've worked on, and granted, I've only worked on TV shows, not films and feature films. This was a feature film, sort of a lower budget feature. The things that I heard going on on that set would never have happened on the sets that I've ever been on. Um, you had people, uh, crew members out on their off time shooting out in the desert shooting, but well, they go plinking, you know, shooting cans off of fences and stuff. Um, you know, live rounds kind of bouncing around here and there. It was a very, 
very um, un. It was a very chaotic set in my mind. Um, and 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 I, I think back to when I, you know, the, the sets I've been on. It was so controlled. Um, the armorers were on top of their game. You know, of course, these were long-running TV shows, 13, 14, 15 seasons. So the mm -hmm. crew was very well uh, organized, and and it would never happen. We were so careful. It was a team of myself, the armorer, the the visual effects guys, the special effects guys, and the stunt guys. And everybody worked together to make sure safety was always paramount. We had safety briefing after safety briefing, um, and and it, you know, it, there are certain basic firearms safety rules. There's, basically four, and I would drill it into every actor I worked with, and I would make them to say it back to me. Treat every gun as if it's loaded. Never point a gun at something you're not willing to kill or destroy. Keep your finger off the trigger until you're ready to fire the weapon. Yeah. And don't point the weapon without knowing your target and what's behind your target. So those four, I mean, my, I, like I said, I had Oscar-nominated actors actually getting um, mocking me back to me because I would drill it into them so often. I say, okay, we're gonna. This scene requires a gun. What are we doing, folks? And they would start spouting verbatim those four laws. And so you always have to be careful with every firearm you're ever around. I mean, look, I, I my dad was a cop. I had guns in the house. He always kept them locked up, of course. But you, you know, I learned from a young age that guns are dangerous things. Whether they're fake, whether they're real, you always treat a gun as if it's, it's real. You treat every gun right. as if it's loaded. Now, I'm not saying I'm not. I'm not passing judgment on Alec Baldwin in this case because I think there is much more responsibility on the armorer. And there's a very big deal with the AD, the first assistant director, who walked that gun from the armor table to the actor. So, and, and, and I think who declared it as a, a, a clean gun or a cold gun. So I think that there's problems here. There's certainly less responsibility on Alec Baldwin than either of the two people that have already, you know, pled guilty or have been convicted in this case. But yeah. whether or not the jury finds it uh, it meets the, the elements of the law in New Mexico, that, that's that's up to them. Bobby, um, thank you for that. I mean, you, your expertise on this issue is amazing. Um, let's get to you, John. Uh, we're going to take one quick question. We need to keep this one tight um, before we get to break. Uh, Mary Claire Rochelieu on uh, YouTube asked, did they not establish rules of evidence before the trial began? This is absurd. And I think that she is talking, John, about all these constant sidebars and the, the objections and then uh, all this back and forth and the jury's just kind of sitting there like, okay, we're, we're, when are we getting this thing going? Right, of course, the effect on the jury is always one thing, but you know what's going on in this case? There's been a lot of animosity between the two sides. Now, and that's normal in a big high profile case, but man, the level of ad hominem attacks and personal attacks in pleadings and in hearings, and you, you sense the tension just watching uh, the objections watching the courtroom. So is that normal for a high profile case? Yes. Has this gotten a little worse than normal? I think it has. And what's the effect on the jury? It's really going to come down to how they perceive the lawyers for each side, how they're doing in there and whether they're rubbing the jurors the wrong way. Yep, that's going to uh, that's going to be a big part of this. Uh, we are going to take a quick break, and when we come back, more of your questions. Stay with us. I'm Anjanette Levy, and you're watching Law and Crime coming to you live from the courthouse here in Santa Fe, New Mexico. <laughs> 